All right, so welcome. I'm going to talk about, uh, we are, I should say, we're going to talk about portable ham radio setups. Uh, just basically different ideas, different ways to get there. And uh, that picture there is obviously field day, I think a couple years ago. And that's Mark, uh, I'm sorry, that's Dave's box sitting there over in the, the voice section. So here's what we're going to do. Every section, I've got a few people here at the club that are going to talk about their setups and whys. And this is how we're going to cover it, the whys, what's, hows and finish up with the lessons learned in the process. And, and the reason I'm doing it this way is, is I've built a couple of things and I've you know done research and you'll see somebody go, I did this. And you never figure out why they did this. Like, is it the best setup? Or was that the only thing that fit? Is that the only thing they found? So I kind of want to be able to get those answers in there. I already talked about my disclaimer. Overview, uh, obviously John can't be here. He sent me his notes. So I'll do my best to uh, brief his setup and answer his questions. Uh, this is the order I'm going to send it up in, and that's also the order that I got input from. So in case you're wondering why people are aware, uh, Dave will be next, then uh, Jason, Mark, Bud, and then I'll talk about um, my setup. Actually, I'll talk about a couple of my setups. So I'll start with John Van Diver. This is actually the first one of these I saw in person at Field Day a few years ago. And I was really just impressed by the fact that it was just one self-contained unit. It was amazing and all the stuff in it. And I saw Dave's later on that day, but John's was the first one. So why? Why did John build that setup? And he said primarily it was for field day. So his, his idea was field day. He needed to be able to port, be portable, but he also wanted a base station. So he didn't have, want to have two different setups. He wanted to have one system that covered the home deal as well as when it came time for field day work, you could drag it out there and set it up. What it is, this is a for you, and we'll talk about this numerous times, but for those who aren't familiar, there's a standard rack size and it's 19 inches wide. And then the U is, is one unit of height. And I don't know what it is. It's like an inch and something, inch and a half. 1.75. There you go. And uh, I said I was going to mute everybody, but it looks like everybody's almost muted anyway. But it's about, so a 4U means you have four of those shelves, or four of those sizes. And, and within that, a shelf can be 2U in size or different, different sizes, but four means you have four of those levels. A 6U means you have six of those levels and so on and so forth. So with the standard 19 inches and the U is standard, but you can see in this case, uh, John's is really a shallow box. And uh, before I get to the next uh, what, I want to point out, he put a 12-volt lighter socket here at the top for convenience to power his laptop up, up solar. So in there, he's got his ICOM 7000. He has the LDG ICOM tuner. I'm going to mute you, Dave. Sorry. Uh, LG ICOM tuner. Yezu, you have the same one for Yezu. He's got a diamond uh, SWR meter. He's got the rig blaster plug and play. That's for his digital modes. It's like uh, their version of Signal Link. Uh, Astron power supply, uh, rig runner for uh, power um, distribution. And he says for his portable setup, he carries an alpha antenna. I don't know if I put a picture in it with him. It's, uh, I think it's an NFED. It's small little package. And he's got a solar panel with a 20 amp hour battery. And that's running through the Westmont radio power gate. So from there through the ring runner to everything else. So here's how we set it up. And I, I mentioned the, the standard rack size. So you can see in this case, the shelves are sticking out the back. So they're pretty, probably standard rack shelves, but his case is a little bit deeper. Now there are covers in the outside of the case. So all that stuff's protected when it's shipped. But when he sets it up, that's what he sees. He wanted to point out that, uh, and I'll cover this lessons learned, but you kind of see where the wiring is. But I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah. Uh, power supply down there. There's this distribution up here. Up here in the corner, you'll see a different picture. That's where his, uh, his uh, what I call it, the computer interfaces. There's a the tuner, there's his meters, and there's his radio. He wanted to point out, uh, you got this ground block in there to make it easier to uh, hook to the ground uh, ground setup there at the field day. 
He's got some nice big cabling too. I'm pretty impressed by this. I don't know what those are, but they're they're pretty big. Here you saw the front picture, and again, this is that uh, signal link equivalent. I forgot what it's called. So I'll look at the notes. So lessons learned overall. He's happy with the setup. Uh, he said, "Luckily, everything fit. I think that'd be a theme. That's tight fit." He's not happy about that rat's nest of wires in the back. Those are his words. And that's why I kind of mentioned the depth of the case. That's one of the drawbacks. Uh, so he'd like a deeper case. And he'd like to be able to store his laptop in a case. So that's kind of tells you where his priorities would be. If he could do a different, deeper case, so the wires are more protected and a place to store his laptop. And I'll be honest, I didn't remember that about his case. I didn't realize it stuck out like that. So any questions on John's setup? I'll try to answer best I can if anybody has a question. All right, I'm moving on to Dave. Dave Martin, K5 YFL. I'm going to meet myself, Dave, and I'll meet you. <clears throat> okay, there's, um, there's my configuration going to Puerto Rico. Uh, this was a new experience for me. I was in field day mode when I did most of my design, but then this was DX mode. I had to, uh, I was told I had to go on an airplane and I had to be able to handle everything myself. So that was my configuration. The two bags were full of clothes and uh, some, uh, some gear, the rolling rack, we'll talk about it in a minute, and then a big antenna bag. Next. Okay, so this um, was an HF kit designed for going on vacation, uh, field day, and same, same similar stuff, except that this was also designed for a, an emergency comm box to be gone at least 72 hours um, uh, under the condition that we would be provided power. Uh, this, this box would normally be operated in, in a large trailer um that's full of com gear and this would be like the the backup to the backup uh for emergency management agencies in texas for a major level one or level two which means hurricane or something that big uh, dis, uh type of disaster that's going to last for 72 hours and our experience has been that it's taken three days to kind of uh, chase the storm and get it in place and then another four or five days before we can pull people out. So next slide. So here's the capabilities. I needed to have HF voice, uh, primarily Windlink. So because I wanted to do radio over email uh, with Pactor. But at the same time, I also wanted to be able to use VHF, UHF voice and data. And that's primarily packet Windlink. Same, uh, same system, just a different uh, part of the spectrum that's used to uh, uh, to get your messages through. And also, I needed to have peer-to-peer radio-only capability, which can be done with uh, Winlink Express and other stations similarly equipped. And this kind of gives me interoperability with Mars, Aries, and Races, and Shares, and, and a few others. And it's primarily designed to be NIVIS. Think of uh, think of comms between Houston, Corpus, and, and Austin, or up here in Austin. So well within the state, not necessarily talking to Washington, D.C., or the, or the West Coast. <clears throat> also want to be able to send ICS forms, principally 213s and 214s over radio, and maybe needing a signature required and something like that. Uh, this is obviously vehicle transportable. It's not something you're going to put on your back and um, hike into the hike into the woods. And uh, uh, like I say, we anticipated power uh, from this trailer, but I'll show you later. We added to 12, external 12 volt connections so we could run battery or solar powered battery. And uh, it follows the incident command system and OXCOM guidelines. If you've had any of those courses that uh, uh, this this is part of their uh, uh, go kit uh, guideline. Next slide, please. Here's the box. Uh, this is a four U. Uh, uh, this is a Sierra Kilo Bravo SKB box, 
and notice that it's got wheels on the bottom uh, and, a, and a handle to haul it around. It's about 65 pounds, and that's one of its drawbacks. But um, I started out with a 6U case, you'll see in a minute, and trying to squish it down to a 4U case. Next slide. Okay, in the box is an ICOM 7200 uh, for HF, for VHF, UHF. There's been a 207 or a 20, ICOM 208. Uh, there's a, a specialized communication system, an SES 7400 Pactor 4 modem and a Cantronics KPC-3. Um, uh, HF antenna and auto tuner are external VHF. UHF antenna and coax are external, and so is the 30-foot portable mast. Um, and the uh, one thing that's also included in that uh, that you might consider is a VHF, UHF handheld radio that is Part 90 approved. Um, uh, principally, if you're in a, if you're in a uh, an operation site that's operating under incident command, there are some 150 megahertz frequencies that you would at least like to be able to monitor, if not talk on, uh, so that you can be part of the uh, uh, the simplex uh, uh, radio net uh, on a, on a site. Next slide. Here's the here's the 4U version. You can see the white face going on the top upper the upper left is the SCS modem. Uh, Next over is the KPC-3 packet modem. And above that is a signal link for sound card. And over to the right is an ICOM 208. That's a VHF, UHF, uh, which is tied into the, the packet uh, modem. Uh, then below that is the, uh, the 7200 at the lower left and an AC power supply, a 30 amp AC power supply. If you'll notice on the left side, um, um, this this thing uh, did not um, uh, completely survive the airline gorillas. You can see the uh, the bent flanges. Uh, thing everything worked. Uh, a couple of connectors got bounced out, but uh, the flange was the only damage. Uh, uh, that, uh, on two airline flights, the one going to Puerto Rico and coming back. I don't know which one got it the worst. Uh, Next slide, please. Here's the back of a um, that my kit's based on uh, a, about 15 kits that we got the state of Texas to buy. And uh, the design was done by a guy in Austin named Lou Thompson, uh, Whiskey Five, uh, India Foxtrot, Quebec, and he designed he designed one of the other kits so that there was this pack in the back for. Uh, storage of Heil headsets and a microphone and some other stuff. So uh, it's a much nicer, much cleaner install than mine. I just have a tray back there, uh, not a little not a little pocket. Um, uh, Lou is uh, an engineer's engineer. Uh, you don't get a cheap solution with him, but you do get a class A solution. Uh, next slide. Here's my, my first uh, attempt with a 6U. Uh, this was at uh, uh, this was in operation at FEMA six at Denton uh, down in the bowels of the of the uh, underground operations center. They had a radio uh, that failed, and I had that in my car. Went out and got it. We plugged into the antennas, and away we went. So uh, similar, and this one you see a a, a, a Pactor three and an ICOM seven hundred six. Uh, Similar stuff, uh, the power supply. Um, it just, I thought it could be more compact, and that's why I went from a 6U to a 4U. Next slide. There's um, there's another way to do that, and that's the, the next slide shows you could put it all in Pelican boxes. And oh, what Jason's. Yeah. That's Jason's? Okay. Yeah. So I would say... Um, Lessons that I learned was it's awful heavy, and without wheels and a, some sort of uh, ability to move it around, you, you could hurt yourself. Um, especially the uh, we're not getting any younger, and after you've been deployed for a while, you uh, 
after three or four days, you just kind of get worn down. I would also say that um, the go box reduces, but doesn't completely uh, prevent stuff getting lost. You'll always find, um, I was always finding when I put stuff on the table, like at the top of this picture, I'd forget something, a mic or a cable or something that wouldn't work. But putting it all together in a box meant that it was there and uh, it wasn't going to be dinged. The cables weren't going to, pins on the cable weren't going to get bent. But remember, it still takes um, a certain amount of of skill to use this thing. So periodically, you got to haul it out other than once a year uh, to remember how to do stuff and to make sure that uh, stuff still works, especially when you got computers, you've got stuff that gets upgraded and, and uh, software that gets uh, changed, uh, whatnot. So you got to periodically use it. Um, and like I said, I would look, a third thing would be look for a way to lighten the load, if at all possible. Um, and this was designed for a uh, hurricane or a flood where you're going to be operating with a, a fixed facility. One of the things that I've been uh, told to think about is what happens if I have an EMP. This is not an EMP-proof package. Uh, so that's something I'm thinking about for the future. Okay. Thanks, Dave. I want to point out, I was going to say this in the beginning. The reason I'm doing this, wanted to do this, is this is what we do at field day. You go wander around, see, you know, see what people are doing, see why they're doing it. And so this is just kind of fill that void. Uh, the participants gave me a lot more information than I put these slides just to, just so I could keep the, 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 the size down. But all the data, all their photos and stuff will be on our groups IO drive. So anything that wasn't in here, there's gonna be a lot more stuff there. I was gonna throw that out there. All right, now it's time for Jason and I'll mute myself and you have the floor. Okay, uh, just uh, real quick, uh, before going to this, uh, I stress that I, I have very minimal actual testing here. So I, the, the, the fun thing here is this is like very experimental, like I haven't in, by that I mean almost like pre-experimenting here. It's like oh, I'm in the process of building this, and I've kind of gotten ideas from talking to different people in the club as well as stuff online. But that's everything I need to get on the air in a basic sense, right there. Um, just in that one little uh, pack there in the in the box. That's one of those like thirty-five dollar Harbor Freight boxes. Uh, I think twenty-five dollars if you have the right coupons or catch them at the right parking lot sales. Um, one of those waterproof, you know, customizable foam cases. And in, inside that's the radio and the battery, which I'll talk more about in a minute, uh, a 50 foot bundle of coax. And then uh, the, the bag on, on, in kind of the upper left there, that is the uh, antenna that he uses as well as a few other things. Uh, next slide. So why do I, have, I come up with this? I am in a uh, 500 square foot apartment. Uh, if you look on my webcam feed right here, you're seeing about half my square footage. So I have very little space. Um, I have a tiny yard, a tiny patio um, and all that. So from the get go of after getting my general license back in 2018, I've been you know very interested in portable setups just because I'm in an apartment, I'm probably gonna be in an apartment for the foreseeable future. So I've been looking at uh, these portable setups for going to a state park, a national forest, um, my parents' backyard when I visit in a couple months, which will probably be my first real test run of this. I'm gonna be going down to Louisiana and I'll have to uh, try it all out. Um, plus I like being outside anyway. I'm uh, really into camping and hiking and stuff like that. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned the Harbor Freight Watertight case. Uh, the radio is a Yaesu FT891. Um, it can do up to 100 watts, I believe. Um, uh, I would like to generally do lower power uh, stuff. Um, the battery I'm using is a BioNO, BioNO, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that, 20 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. Um, I went with it. it, it's definitely a more expensive one but uh i read that it's pretty much the gold standard and one thing one lesson in life i've learned mostly from outdoors gear is 
don't buy the cheap one because all that you'll end up doing is upgrading to the expensive one later. So just get the expensive one and the fir- the good one in the first place and save the the money from the cheap one. Um, like I said, the, uh, the antenna is an MP1 super antenna. It's a little like tripod vertical HF antenna. Um, it's pretty neat. It has a little sliding deal on it that uh, helps tune it for the frequency you're on. Uh, just briefly playing with it on in my uh, small yard I have here. It I on the on the band I was uh, tuned in for I was getting you know without hardly any adjustment to it 1.2 1.3 ish SWR um, so pretty good SWR um, I, I would like to play with it with, with an antenna analyzer a little bit and I do have a thing to make one of those but that's another story um, I'd eventually like to go into like a backpack solution you know where it can be like in kind of a, a big hiking backpack kind of thing. Um, and I think my build is small enough to be able to do that. Um, depending on, you know, where I go with it. Um, I'm eventually interested in doing something with draws. Like, uh, if, if you, you saw Mike's presentation on that, um, that's something that's very interesting. I'm very interested in, especially doing like some of the QRP digital stuff and all, um, which I've read uh, with the antenna I have, it does tend to do a pretty good job with that. Like kind of most of the reviews I read are, Great job for digital, great job for CW phone, hit or miss. Uh, depends on how open of an area you're in, stuff like that. But to quote Bud, if it's an antenna, it's a compromise. And, well, I don't have the room for a big antenna, anything like this. So my compromise was get something that's very portable, very easy to use here, but I'm sacrificing, you know. I'm not going to be doing the contest DXing, talking to people in Russia, most likely, uh, stuff like that. So, um that's that. Um, and then eventually I'd like to look into charging and power distribution, you know, maybe a solar panel type thing. Uh, right now I just have the one battery with the one connection to the radio. Um, I know uh, Dave has talked to me about like the rig runners and stuff like that. So uh, like I said, this is a very early stages of this setup and I'm, I'm kind of still working on things. Uh, next slide. So the house, uh, there's the, the, the case I was talking about opened up the radio and uh, battery sit in there very nicely um like i said it's, it's a nice it's not the the lightest case obviously the case wouldn't work in a backpack or something like that that's another thing i'm going to have to look into is how to secure it in a backpack to protect it and all that but certainly great for field day where you're just kind of setting up out of the back of your car or something like that so uh next slide um, so lessons learned, um, I am there. Uh, I made this little Venn diagram to kind of explain, you know, I feel like this is almost anything in uh, the amateur radio community. Uh, between portable, powerful, and affordable, you can pick two. Um, all three is what we call black magic. Um, so I'm kind of in the more, I had to balance portability and affordability. So I got limited capabilities of what I can do there. Um, like I said, I'm, you know, where, where I made the sacrifices on some of the more powerful stuff um, because I'm limited on power, I'm limited on antenna. Um, so that's the main thing there. Um, things, uh, uh, the things I would potentially do differently, I don't know yet because I haven't gotten a lot of experimentation with it. But like I said, I think when I have a couple of good opportunities for that uh, coming up soon. But uh, I guess one thing I would have done is not be in a 500 square foot apartment, but alas, I signed the lease before I was a ham. So um, I don't know if I have any more slides. Is there? No, that was uh, it. Okay. Um, any questions? Thank you, Jason. Yeah, you kind of hit on it, right? It's just about experimentation and trying stuff out. Mm-hmm. All right, next victim. Mark, you walk away? No, no, I was unmuting, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, this, I had to first figure out what question I was gonna answer when uh, I saw Mike you know, make several requests and I kept thinking, yeah, I need to submit something, but uh, what, 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 what question am I answering? Uh, but here's a picture of what I typically take and what you see is the radio case in the top left, the antenna analyzer case in the top right. 
and a buddy pull antenna at the bottom. That's it. Everything all packed up. Next slide. So Mike captured in two bullets, very succinct, succinctly. Uh, but what was my primary driver? Uh, I'm only allowed to take one radio, and I am space and weight limited. Uh, most of my portable ops are when I'm out camping. Uh, I'm away from primary power, but I do have a, a generator where I can recharge batteries. Um, in addition to that, I, I give a buddy pull demo every year at the Orlando Hamcation. So whatever I take has to answer the following two questions. Number one, who's carrying it? Well, of course, that's me. And uh, that means being able to put it in the car, get it out of the car, uh, take it to baggage check, reclaim it from baggage claim, and take it to and from the demo. I'm literally the, the pack mule for all of that. Um, the second question is, will it give a successful demo? Now, this, this particular setup does come with some risk, but I'll cover that in a minute. Next slide. So what do I take? Uh, you saw in slide number one that uh, uh, all but the antenna is transported in Pelican cases. That's to protect from two primary things, bumps and rain. Uh, when I'm out camping and I'm operating, uh, a lot of times the, everything's spread all over the, the picnic table. Uh, so when it starts raining, I just want to be able to throw stuff in the boxes and button the boxes down and I'm all set. I don't have to worry about throwing things into the tent and uh, busting something. Uh, the particulars there, the radio obviously you see is a, a Yaesu FT817, uh, actually the, the November Delta model, which has uh, 60 meters in it. Uh, its, its pluses are it's all band and all mode. Um, the risk is it's only 5 watts. And that was a risk I alluded to earlier. Um, I did add the the Bravo Hotel India is the name of the company, BHI uh, Audio DSP, which basically is a, an excellent uh, uh, audio level noise filter. Uh, its downside is it's a huge battery hog. So, you know, you, you trade off uh, operational time for being able to hear what the other person at the, uh, what the person at the other end is saying. Uh, all my power is interconnected by Anderson power poles and, uh, November Zero Whiskey Lima there makes an excellent uh, uh, add-on to the 817 that basically bolts on the back that uh, li literally plugs into the 817's power connector and has and Anderson power poles sticking out sideways. So it's, it's fabulous. I don't have to worry about wearing out the, um, the power connector on the 817 by plugging and unplugging the power cable. Uh, I can always replace the Anderson power poles in it. Um, I do, in the box, have an Elecraft uh, Tango 1 auto tuner. Uh, it's great for stretching bandwidth uh, without having to retune the antenna coils, um, particularly on 40 meters. Uh, the, the shortened dipole, and, and uh, uh, Jason referred to Bud's comment about uh, if it's an antenna, it's a compromise. I, I, my, uh, my Elmer said something uh, very similar, that is, uh, whatever antenna you use, it is some kind of compromise. You just have to choose which compromise you're going for. Um, but the, the antenna tuner will let me uh, stretch that a little bit. Um, Right-hand case had the MFJ269 Pro antenna analyzer. Now, to me, the antenna analyzer is almost as important as a radio. Obviously, I can't communicate without a radio, but uh, when you're only operating five watts, you can't communicate very well. Uh, unless you get the antenna uh, tuned to resonance and the antenna analyzer is critical for that. Um, the buddy pole antenna is my portable antenna of choice. And again, it's compromises portability. Uh, it, it meets that uh, very, very well. Uh, everything for the buddy pole antenna fits in a, a tube bag, which is 12 inches in diameter and 24 inches long uh, with an, a nice uh, full length zipper and uh, handles. Uh, the buddy pole will operate 6 meters to 40 meters with the standard coils that come with it. And if you buy the larger coils, you can actually operate 80 meters with it. I'm not sure why anybody would try. Uh, 40 meters is a challenge already. Uh, it will also do 2 meters if you want to. I haven't ever done that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so these are the close-ups. On the left-hand side there, you see the antenna analyzer. I have all the adapters. Uh, it's an end connector on the top of the analyzer and uh, uh, the adapters let me go to anything else. Now, uh, you know, starting out with this as a portable system, obviously the MSJ269 is not really a very good choice for portability, but it's certainly a workhorse. Uh, it's what I have. You know, I, I had a, a native Texas boss, uh, first place I worked after I graduated from college, moved from Indiana down here to Texas. And his native Texas saying was, 
you dance with them, what brung you? Okay, well, this is what I have. This is the first thing I bought, and I haven't bought anything else otherwise, uh, although there are some really nice portable antenna analyzers. This one works very well. And at the end, I will, uh, uh, if you have one of these, they do have kind of a bad reputation, but I'll cover that at the end. Uh, Right-hand case there, you see the antenna analyzer on the left, uh, microphone, and a bunch of uh, cable Ys for power. So I can plug the battery into one single end and have two outputs. Uh, and then bottom left-hand corner of that right-hand case is a, a small LED flashlight. You never know when the light, lights are going to go out on you when you're busy operating or uh, you need to find something in the dark. Uh, and then next slide. Under that top layer, the, both of these pictures are of the radio case. Under that top layer of the radio case, there's a piece of bubble wrap. And then under the bubble wrap, majority of the case's size is taken up by the 817 itself. Right-hand side is a, a 120 volt to 12 volt DC uh, AC power adapter. And its cable is in the front end. And that's a, I think a six foot cable, which I've cut out of the 12 volt supply. Uh, so I can use that and put Anderson power poles on both ends. So I can use that six foot cable either with my batteries or with my AC supply as, as appropriate. And the 817 uh, close up on the right hand side there. Next slide. So uh, what have I learned along the way? Uh, again, I already covered the antenna analyzer for me is critical. When you're operating only five watts, you can't afford to throw much away. Um, so the, the bad reputation of the MFJ 259, 269 analyzers is uh, their power button is not protected. So when you toss it in a box with a bunch of other things and it bangs around, it's eventually going to turn itself on. And that's really bad because when you go to use it, it is already on and the batteries are dead. Well, it's not very useful at that point. Um, but I discovered a secret uh, a long time ago that when you plug the AC adapter into the power connection on the MFJ269, 259, it actually disconnects the power switch completely. So if you just take one of those connectors, one of those plugs, power plugs, with nothing else connected to it, and you plug it into the power jack, you have disconnected that power switch and it will never turn itself on. And I can tell you in the in the five plus years that I've owned my 269, I have replaced, now it takes uh, 10 batteries, I think it is. Yeah, 10 batteries, 10 AA batteries. So it's kind of expensive to replace those batteries. I have replaced those batteries once in the five years that I've used it. And I use it a lot. I, I use it quite often and, and uh, you know, multiple times a year. So uh, uh, if, if you put that power plug, about the only thing you might need to do, which I did, was I tied a thread to the back end of that power plug and uh, cast the epoxy on the back of it. And I tied that thread to one of the other connectors on the 269 so that the power plug doesn't get lost uh, when I take it out and make use of the analyzer. Um, the third thing there is, uh, uh, which we won't, you know, Mike said we're not going to cover power, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, the battery packs that I use, the uh, lithium ferrophosphate, are made by a company specifically, uh, uh, A123, Alpha123, and those cells have a, um, uh, a very nice feature in that they're, one of their electrodes is a spongy metal, and therefore they can source and sync current very efficiently. Um, I can actually use those battery packs, mine are 10 amp hour battery packs. I can use them with my 756 Pro at full 100 watts. And I get multiple hours of operation out of that, those batteries. Um, they happen also to, let's see, what did I say? They double as my CPAP batteries when I'm out camping. So. And I've owned them for almost 10 years and they still are very serviceable, very little, uh, if any evidence of degradation, uh, they, they still recharge fully and they, uh, they last a long time. Tastes good. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I think, any, I think that was it. That's, I'm done, thanks. Any questions? Any questions from the audience? So I was going through your, your, your list, Mark, and I, that's why I put the new uh, product number on that BHI board. I didn't even know what that was. It's actually yeah. an internal DSP for the 817. I was like, that is cool. Right. About the only thing that, that made me think twice about putting it in was you have to drill a hole in the case of your 817. Yeah. But I'm curious. It, it only hurt for a few minutes. Does 817 have fusing built in? Uh, fusing as in Fuse. overload? Yeah. 
I was just curious. Uh, you have to have uh, fuses in line from your power supply to the Anderson power pole connector. I don't. <laughs> Probably shouldn't. Have. <laughs> well, at five watts, what are you going to do? Let the magic smoke out. <laughs> I'm just curious. I was thinking about that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mark. As I said, there's more photos, more information, and his write-up will be on the group SIO page. It is about three pages of just battery math, so that's why I wrote just math. <laughs> All right, next victim. Who we got? Bud. You here, Bud? I'm here. Can you hear me? Hey, you're loud and clear. All right. Do any of you remember the big hump in the middle of the floor, the front of the floorboard in your car? I I had this thing, you can see it on the picture here, called a hump saddle. I've had that thing since, well, I guess since the last car I had that had a big transmission up in front of the car. And, and it had been sitting in my garage for 30 years or more with a CD radio track on top of it. If you look right up underneath the radio there, there's, there's your grill for the speaker. You could have an external speaker in it. Um, any, anyway, that had been sitting there for a while. And I, this whole project was partly, I know this sounds silly, but it was partly to find a use for that hump saddle. And uh, so go to the next slide. Now, this, this is really as, as much, this is really more of a, a mobile system than it is a portable system. But it gives you all the advantages of a portable system without having to take it out of your car. But I'm coming close to retirement. I'm saying, all right, I've got a certain amount of money I want to spend, and I want to be able to have a system that I can have in more than one car one radio that I can operate HF two meter and seven centimeters all with this one radio. I don't want two radios. Uh, and I wanted to make it fairly practical to move the rig from one vehicle to the other. Now, this other thing was real important. Uh, my vehicles are small. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to uh, run the battery down on the car uh, playing ham radio operator. So this thing had to be able to operate completely independent of the vehicle power. And that's where the 80 amp hour battery comes from. So next slide. So what I did was I started with the hump saddle. Uh, I had learned about the Yazoo FTA 57. My brother's got a couple of them, and I know there's a couple guys in, in the club that have got them. Mike's got them. Uh, pretty neat little radio. Um, it isn't the only one I could have used. I know Kenwood and, and Icon both have really nice units that would work just as well, maybe maybe even a little better than the FT-857. But I could afford that one. It was on sale, so I bought it. Um, one of the things that I liked about it is it's got a remote control head. And I wanted to be able to mount the radio behind the seats of my pickup truck or in the trunk of my car and have a control head mounted on the dash. <clears throat> so the radio comes with a separation kit. But I went and bought two more separation kits. So I wanted to be able to mount the control head in both cars and also have a, a, a carry along or carry outside the car control head. So I've got I've got a total of three of them. All right. In order to keep this thing from interfering with the electrical system in the car, but take advantage of the electrical system in the car to charge the battery. I put this thing called an ISO power uh, device in it, a West Mountain radio. And basically what it does is it isolates the radio and the station battery from the electrical system in the car. It connects directly to the battery in the car. If the alternators running and putting out 13.8 or more volts, well then it opens a switch and connects to the station battery and charges the station battery. But the radio basically runs off the station battery. Problem is, at 12 volts, even 12.6 volts, well, Mark, you can appreciate this, I'll probably be getting about 
well, not much more than five lots. In fact, I noticed on one at 12 and a half full time was actually getting 17 lots out. When I started the engine and revved it up, I was getting 97. So 80 watts difference between 14 volts and a little over 12. That was huge. So um, something I had tried out earlier on, and I ended up buying another one for this project, is this M8XJK Super Booster. And it's not really for voltage depth. It's, what the deal with the Super Booster is, is that it, it's got two modes. It's got bypass mode, which so it connects to the bad station battery, and the output connects to the radio. In, in bypass mode, it's just basically connecting the station battery to the radio. Then it's got a built-in switching power supply that boosts the output voltage as, up to as much as 15 volts. Uh, I, I was setting these at 13.8, and I thought, why are you doing that? Crank it up to 14. So, so now I've got 14 volts coming out, and i got a little switch on a remote control on the dash that I can switch on. It'll take that thing out of bypass and switch it into uh, full operational mode. So now I can have a 400 watt PVP output from the radio while running on the battery. I didn't do that with a battery as low as 9 volts. Don't recommend it. As the battery gets down below 12 volts, disconnect. You need to charge that battery. Um, then then uh, again, I mentioned I have an 80 amp hour station battery. One weakness of that is, is it's kind of heavy. Uh, and in the case of this system, both of my vehicles have a, a vertical loaded antenna that will do either, well, the, the pickup truck, I can handle 75, 40, and 20 meters on it. Or at least that's what I have it tuned for now. And just, just by moving a, a cable from, from one location to another, you change which band it's on. But, the Volkswagen does 40 meters to 20 meters. Uh, but you can fairly easily connect, uh, hang a dipole in a tree or a long wire in a tree and put straight to it. Not a problem. Next slide. Okay, so on the left is, is a picture of the uh, complete system sitting on a table in my driveway. So it, it'll come out of the car fairly easily. You see the hump saddle with the radio in the middle. On, on your right is the uh, super booster, and on your left, where you see the red and black cables coming, is the uh, uh, West Mountain Radio ISO power. So that's what connects to the vehicle battery, and also the, the wire going down under the table connecting to that 80 uh, amp hour battery. And then between the radio and my easy chair back there, I decided to leave the beer off while well, I was tempted. But that's my remote. That remote's actually kind of cool because what I did was I took a standard old ordinary metal bookend, mounted a speaker on the bookend, and then at the top of that bookend, I mounted the, uh, the, the uh, uh, remote unit to, to hold the, the uh, control head. And you see that big pile of cable. The object with that big pile of cable is you, know, you roll down the passenger side window on the car or the pickup truck, you stick that cable in through that, and you plug it in as an extension to the cables that are going through the control head in the dash. Take the control head out, plug it onto this one, and carry this thing off the table or the back of the pickup truck. This was what Larry didn't understand when we were talking about. Um, using my pickup truck for a, a go-to station. Because all you have to do is pull up next to a uh, picnic table, take this remote, plug it into the uh, extension cables in the cab of the pickup truck, drag this thing out on the table, and bingo, you got a go-to station. It's all there. And that on the far right there is a picture of this thing. Let's see, do I have any more slides? Yeah, I guess I do. So, uh, all right, what happened to you? I'm trying to keep track of where I am. All right, so that next, go to the next slide. So there, there it is again in the pickup truck, and you see right up underneath the, uh, the control head mount, I've got two 12-volt 
meters, one of them monitors the, the uh, uh, station battery. That'll be the one on your right. One monitors the car battery. That's the one on the left. And then that little switch in the middle, flip that up, and a green light on the bottom comes on and tells you that you're getting full voltage to the system. Also, where that thing's mounted, this thing uses a thing from a company called Protest. You basically just pry the uh, uh, pry the trim material off, and this thing's custom designed to screw in behind that trim material, and the trim material goes right on top of it. You don't have to drill any holes in your car, and 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 then that Archon thing well, that holds my cell phone. So the the, uh, the radio control head and the cell phone and the remote control for the super booster all sit on the same item. Uh, Picture on the right is uh, this system in the uh, Volkswagen in the trunk. All the way at the back is the uh, hump saddle with the equipment on it. And then towards the front end of this thing is the 80 amp hour battery. And I also have an extra uh, set of wires with Anderson power poles on the battery that I can just walk up with a battery charger anytime and plug the battery charger in and fully charge the battery. So, lessons learned. There were two or three of them, and, and I didn't uh, uh, I didn't get them all I didn't get them all to to uh, Mike when I wanted to. First lesson that I learned on this thing was be careful what technology you're implementing. That uh, super booster turned out to be a, a potential loss because if I wanted to duplicate the system, I may not be able to get that thing. The, uh, the hand that invented it, I guess, has gone on. And uh, for, I know, you know, a good year, year and a half, it wasn't, it wasn't acquirable. Fortunately, West Mountain Radio bought the right to that, so you can buy that thing from West Mountain Radio. Otherwise, you're going to have to uh, substitute an MFJ, which is less capable. The other thing that I learned uh, that was real serious was if the antenna manufacturer tells you that there's a limit to how much power you can put into it, there are losses. And uh, the antenna is probably the most important, the single weakest link, if you will, in making affordable operation successful. Again, Mark is going to understand that. It goes to a lot of trouble to make sure it works. Uh, if there are losses, there's going to be heat. That heat's going to translate into damage, so therefore you can't put more than 200 watts into this plug. So my next step on this is I'm going to build my own coil that uh, is not going to be power so power limited. Anyway, the last thing I, that I, I learned on this is I don't like amp. I do not like those uh, Molex connectors. You can't take them off, put them on, take them off, put them on. It's hard for arthritic old men. So, so I'm going to change that to something different here in the future. I just don't know what. Probably an amphenol or, or maybe even a DNA. Anyway, anyone got any questions? I can hear all muted, so if you want to ask a question, hit the, your wave your hand button, or I'm looking on the camera as one or the other. Hey, you know, but as far as my concern, this fell exactly within the category we want to discuss, because this is a portable setup. You move it from one place to another, and now it's not a permanent auto install. So. This is exactly in the criteria. Well, it is, it, and it is on wheels. <laughs> exactly. But, but but there is there is the negative in that that battery is heavy. So if I want to move that thing, uh, it, it, it's a, a small chore to, to move that from one vehicle to the other. But since everything's already wired in both vehicles, all I've got to do is move the hump saddle and the battery and plug it all in. And hopefully it's not 140 degrees inside the car while I'm doing that. Is the battery on quick connects? You have the, the giant- Anderson? Everything is, all of the power is on Anderson power pole. All of it, so yeah. Thanks, bud. Hey, the time's going pretty good in this. I was worried it's gonna go long. The uh, last two are actually mine and there's a reason for that. So I'm gonna mute you here. Oh, you already got yourself, all right. So now you get to listen to me talk some more. So these are the two I did, and the one on the left, the lower little one, that was the first one I did. 
and the one on the right, uh, I just, I want to say I finished, it's almost mostly finished right now. So the first one I did, I did this a few years ago, and I really, I was trying to think back of when it was, but it's been maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I think I did this. And originally I had a permanent install in my truck, and then, uh, I don't remember what the reasoning was. I'm pretty sure I started with a permanent install in my truck and then I, I turned it into this. But I use this for a lot of stuff I'll kind of get into. But this is where I started. Uh, why? Cheap. We were talking about that, right? Cheap. Small, portable, and cheap. Did I mention that yet? And I need one solution for home, or a mobile or, or home. And initially, that's what it was, just the car or the home. And later on, a whole lot more uses in it. What is it? This is a 50 cal ammo can, but it's a deep one. So it's uh, taller than the average ammo can you find. And I bought a bunch of different ammo cans trying to find the right sized ones that, that worked. I have even a bigger one than this that I used in the A57. I'll show you later. Uh, can with D710s in it. Uh, everything in the can, I'll show you another, speak, another picture, but everything on the list is in the can except for those bungee cords. So it's can with D710. I got uh, all the accessories and the speaker. And to hold it together, I got the uh, Durlin plastic, which is the, what those white cutting boards are made out of. And the beauty of those is you can cut it with regular tools, just like wood. You know, so you can put a wood screw in it. You can cut it with your, your regular saws. Great stuff to work with. This makes a mess, but great stuff to work with. And like I said, bungee cords. So the entire setup is that and bungee cords. So that's what looks inside the can. Uh, obviously, the radio, the D710 doesn't even have a head, right? It's always a remote head setup. So I put it face down, like a better term, so that you can see the fan, exhaust fans up at the top. That's the antenna connector. And all the little plugins are all available right there. So it's if I want to plug something in, it's available. In this pile here, all the accessories in a bag right there is the remote head. And you can see this. This is a, uh, and this stuff isn't really well shielded, but this is a like a, a network or a phone add-on jack box thing. And the Kenwood uses... Uh, the eight pin like cat five style plugs for both the head and the mic. So in order to keep from plugging the wrong thing in, now the smoke doesn't come out necessarily, but it just caused some drama if you don't know which one's which, is the mic cord is black. So I just kept all the mic stuff black and I kept all the head unit cords gray. And that way it was easy to go, oh yeah, that's this and this. And the reason for that is I use this in my truck and I was using it in my VW also. So I'm using the truck, and I just got already had the cables pre-laid. Just plug, plug, boom, I'm ready to go. This is all the stuff yanked out of the can. Uh, like I said, it's from automatic remote head setup anyway. So that's the uh, head mount that comes with it. And I had a speaker. I glued magnets on the bottom of those two things so I could stick them wherever I wanted to. Uh, this bag, I think, has all the uh, extension cables for the head unit and the mic cord. This is just the data cables in case I want to program the radio or do APRS or something. And then this is all the, all the power cables I might need. And I won't say all I might need, but it's got a ladder cord and it's got all the usual uh, parts. And I have a, uh, the Anderson junction block and I have a, a little uh, voltage polarity tester. So you know, maybe everything's hooked up correctly, but if I plug the voltage polarity tester in and it, it doesn't say it's good, then I know. I shouldn't plug the radio in. Uh, was there something else I want to talk about that? I don't think so. So what I learned uh, works, and it never didn't work. I could put every beautiful vehicle for Hot and Hell 100, and this is what I was kind of getting at. Uh, the Hot and Hell, you know, we go long ways off from Wichita Falls, too far to hit with the handheld. I could barely hear the repeaters on the handheld. So you need something with some some power and a good antenna, and so. Uh, for the hundred hill, I ride in one of the air conditioned vehicles rather than sitting under a tent like Kai and some of the other guys. So uh, we get a different vehicle donated by a dealership every year. And so I don't know what I'm going to get into, but I know I can take this case. I bungee cord it down. That's what I was going to tell you. Let me go back one slide. So I mentioned the mag mount, right? Well, this ammo, all ammo cans, the lid comes off. You slide it over a little bit, the lid comes off. Well, this is my mount for this stuff. So I had this laying on top of the console, if there is one, usually there have been, and these mag mount on top of that. So that's my entire remote setup is sitting right there on the console, bungee cord down. 
so it doesn't go and kill somebody. Uh, the drawbacks, so like I said, that part works. I was able to use it all the time, good power. It always worked and, and so happy about it. The unfortunate part is it's still a rat nest of wiring. And I've been working on trying to, I bundled the cords and some protective sleeves just to try to make it less of a rat's nest. But still, you've got the head unit cords, you got power cords and stuff like that. So it's just, uh, I'd like for it to be better, but it's about as good as it's going to get. And you saw it's real organized right now in the bags. Well, after I deploy it and try to put it in the back of the bags, it takes forever to get it reorganized again to get all fit in the thing. So usually what I do is I just put the radio on the main stuff in the can. I throw everything else in my backpack. And then when I get home, I, I, re, un, I reset it up and put it back in the cans. And you did see on top of the can, I have a list of what's supposed to be in there so I don't forget it. And Dave kind of mentioned that. Uh, sorry, talk about, oh, so there's no antenna in there, obviously. Uh, standard dual band antenna uh, with the mag mount and, and also a, a, what do they call them, gutter mount, clamp mount. I carry those in a backpack. So I have those in a backpack with a bungee cords and then, you know, the usual water, whatever. And then the radio's in the other bag. I'm sure there's no question on that one. So here's progress. So now I've got my, I call it the Dave inspired box. Like I said, the first one I saw was John's, but when I saw Dave sit up later on and he sent me some info about it, I was like, oh yeah, that's the way I got to go. You know, my bag is a little bit different than, than Dave's, but same idea, same rack size for you. Mine has wheels that are removable, removable part of the end, which is kind of handy because it's a huge storage space, but basically the same box. Uh, and I'll show you how I got to that point in a bit, but I, I built, so I had that D17 in a can, Z710 in a can. I also built one from my A57, a similar can. And ham at our field day a few years ago, I deployed that setup. I ended up not using it because I had a, a totally unrelated problem with a, a, uh, the cat, whatever, the radio control cable, unrelated to the everything else, but I couldn't really use it. So it's a huge rat nest. Oh, my God. Uh, so the next iteration you saw last year, I used a rigid plastic toolbox uh, set it up. Now that, it didn't work as well as I thought. It, I had more junk to put in than I expected. So it was a bit of an RFI nightmare and a rat's nest. It was enough RFI nightmare that it was kicking Dave's USB stuff off every time I transmitted. <laughs> I'm blocking my own view. And I wanted all in one solution with secure wiring and no rat's nest. Uh, these are the whys. Had to be able to work on it. So that's one of the things I learned looking at, you know, Dave and John's setup. What if I need to change something or work around something? How do I get at it? And like I said, last last bullet is I was jealous, jealous of Dave and John. So these are my first iterations. Uh, like I said, a few years ago, Field Gay, you saw that one on the left. That's the 57 the same kind of setup with the uh, the remote, you know, the, the phone connector thing. At least with the Yezu, it's two different plugs, so you can't get them screwed up. My antenna tuner is down below, so that's that same as the John had his. It's just the Yezu version, the LDG YT100. And in here, I just had, I was trying to figure out how I could put a meter in this little hole, but I never really got that far. But here's the retinas, right? So here's my data cables. And then here's speaker and power cable. And here's the antenna going out to the tuner and then tuner out. Okay, so there's a cat cables coming for the tuner to the radio and then to the computer and power. Ridiculous. So like I said, last year, this is my iteration. I had a screen in the upper part and the whole radio jammed in there, but it, was, it just wasn't, I had to, reason it was bad for RFI is I had to cross cables all the time to make it all fit and it just didn't work, but it got me to here. And you've already seen this picture and this isn't even the way it looks right now, but that's, that's the concept. It's all one setup with the screen and the radio and everything else and with the draw set up with a portable keyboard i don't need anything else is ready to go so what is it it's the same brand skb for you rolling rack case i i got a deal as sold as used and uh, i figured it'd be you know maybe beat up a little bit i got it as brand new in the box it was like a dealer return so i got lucky there inside i have two rack uh two of these they're rack size sliding shelves and they were a real benefit, but I'll cover that in a bit. They're, they weren't 100% benefit. Uh, the ACU 857, the top of the tuner, 
I got draws in there. The signal link initially before I had the draws, I have SDR play in the back for doing the uh, pan adapter stuff where I can see the waterfalls, all that digital fun stuff. Uh, power supply, the video monitor, obviously. Uh, my minimum antenna setup that I have for portable whatever is just a buddy stick, which is the baby version of the buddy pole that Mark has. And for bigger setups, I have a, other antennas I can string up, but that's kind of the basic. Here's what mine looks like open the box. Again, you see some similarities. Again, I've got that same connector. In fact, a lot of stuff came out of the box as moved it. Uh, power supply, you notice I had to notch out this uh, shelf here because the top curls over. This one, different brand. It's a taller shelf, but the top doesn't curl over, but it's too tall. This is shorter, but this top curls back, so it, it made it hard to fit stuff. So I just cut this out and then drilled a hole so the tuner button fit. Eh, it works. Uh, so you can see that's a 1U slider. What I want to point out, uh, the standard for 1U is right there, right? In most racks, you have a third screw that isn't matched up with the others. It's, I don't know what it's designed for, but I'll give you my opinion on that. Up here at the top, you can just kind of barely see the monitor. I have it actually down one screw so it all fit. So I'm not using the one use space, which would be here. I have it down one, which means I had to drill out these mounts so I could get the screws to fit. Uh, this is with the slide out, obviously. And the beauty of it is uh, easy access to work on it. And even easier than that, just like the drawers of your house, you pull two latches and the whole slide comes out. All I got to do is unhook uh, the antenna wires on the ground and it all comes right out. And that's obviously with the screen up. And I've added, the screen isn't permanently attached. There's a U, uh, HDMI connector right there. So I can plug it into the drawers or if I want to plug it into a laptop, which is how I got into this to begin with, as I wanted it, just like I did with that other box, I want an external screen for my uh, laptop. So here's the back side. Uh, worried about heat. So I've got this big fan in the back. Uh, it's actually pretty quiet. It's running right now and I can't even hear the thing. Uh, there's a couple little fans on top just to help air circulate. I haven't had a heat problem, but you know, why wait? You can see the typical antenna connectors, the ground connector. Now I mentioned I want to be able to work on it. I'm going to talk about this in a second. I want to be able to work on it. And so these mesh panels have these thumb screws so I could pull them off. Well, the shelves, you know, if you're a rack, they use the same holes. So I, I kept filling with this as I was building it and taking it apart and rebuilding it. And I realized that all I need is one screw on each shelf and, and everything will stay stationary. It won't move around. So what I did is I drilled out extra holes. So these are uh, screws holding the racks in permanently. And I could just remove the, the, uh, these mesh panels uh, independently of the, of the rack shelves themselves. I could pull it all apart and totally functional. When I was first building it, every time I did this, the racks, the shelves came loose and I had to then put the screws back in to hold the racks back in. So you can imagine the, the joy that was. So this is a big variation that I've seen on a lot of setups is everybody's using, and I have one of these, everybody's using the little computer connector power, sl power slots. And I was like, well, what if I lose that cord? This is a, this uses a standard extension cord. I just plug it in and it goes. And this is just a, an extension of the wire adapter. So it has two more plugs on it. One goes up to the monitor and one goes to my power supply. And then here's the USB connector. So here's my rat nest. But uh, this is close to the current, uh, um, current version. I do have, as I've been working on this and looking at Dave's and talking about things, I realize that there's a change I can make to improve it. But this is what it looks like if I pull the thumb screws off. And obviously this picture is older before I had the final setup. But if I pull the thumb screws off, this is what you see. I have access to this whole area. There's all the fuses. Here's all my SDR is down here. This is a uh, switcher so that when I hit transmit the radio, the SDR doesn't go up in smoke. And this is an additional attenuator just in case the switcher breaks so I don't blow up the SDR. It doesn't affect the receive at all. It affects the SDR receive a little bit, but that's a compromise I'm willing to accept. And in here, there's a USB hub for all the other stuff. So as I was looking at this and thinking about it, I think I could put the draws right here. And that would save one step, because if I want to switch back to using the signal link and the my laptop control the radio, I need to move a USB cable from the draws way up there back into this hub. 
Additionally, if I put this down here, I think there's room that I can add. And here's the one thing I don't have is I don't have a DC input at all. If I don't have AC power available, I'm, I'm dead in the water. But I could put one of those uh, various forms of external isolation setups. And I think I could fit both those down in this area. And that would be my final solution. But this is basically where it's sitting right now. Lessons learned, rather be looking good. Oh, man. So many choices I made that actually worked out, but not planned. Just things just kind of worked out that way. And one example is back here. So this is the back of the sliding shelf of the monitor. And then you can't see it because it's extended, but the radio rack is down here. Well, this is a shelf also separate. This is just mounted to the back. And it goes in about an inch or so underneath this one. And it goes just above the radio. So I was able to work this shelf in here to mount all this stuff above the radio and below this thing. And I didn't even think about the time. I thought I had plenty of room. So that's the got lucky. It would be a lot easier with a bigger box, but obviously a bigger box is bigger. Uh, sliding drawers are winners. So easy to work on it. When I was pulling back and forth, hooking stuff up, great. But there's an issue with cable length. You have a long cable. As you retract the drawer, the cable has to go somewhere without pinching. So you got to have be able to guide it or at least roughly have an area for it to go. On the other hand, if it's too short, you can't get the radio all the way out. And right now my grounding setup isn't optimal and it's too short. Uh, obviously, instead of monitor, I put a laptop in that same spot. Uh, I like to talk about putting the drawers in the back. Is uh, So the what I learned is the more flexible it is and what it can do, capability, the more complex it gets, i.e., the sliding drawers is fantastic for flexibility, but man, it made it so difficult. So I think that is all my slides.